getting the exposure to grow your small wedding business can be difficult. With millions of engaged couples using The Knot to plan their weddings and find vendors, advertising on our sites will connect you with more couples than anywhere else online. Meet engaged couples where they're already searching for vendors like you. And let us deliver leads to help you grow your business. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast to sign up today. Mention code PODCAST15 during your free onboarding session for 15% off your first month. Hello, and thank you for listening to the history of World War II podcast, episode 289, The Invasion of New Guinea. Last time, the islands of New Britain and New Ireland, just off New Guinea's east coast, fell to the Japanese. The conquest had been relatively simple, but the odds had been heavily on the invader's side. Still, now it was time to go after the big prize, New Guinea itself, which begged the question, where were the three American carriers that had been lucky enough not to be at Pearl Harbor during the surprise attack? But first things first, now that New Britain was the latest Japanese acquisition, thousands of troops were offloaded there to protect it. Repairing the damage done by the departing Aussies got underway, with special emphasis on the two airfields, and the buildings still standing, as they were to be used for housing for the troops and their officers. The great irony being that the Japanese set about to restore the facilities the Aussies wrecked, having lost the ability to defend it, from these same Japanese troops who had bombed them for the last few weeks. But it doesn't stop there. Now that the islands belong to Imperial Japan, the Australians immediately started bombing them, hoping to wreck the same facilities they had once defended. Such is war. As times were still hard for the Aussies, what with most of their men and machines of war elsewhere, their bombing raids on Rabaul, coming in every other day, were carried out by Catalina flying boats. They were the only vehicles that could make the long 500-mile run with 4,000 pounds of bombs. But even these long-range birds were forced to fly along the south coast of New Britain, as the Owen Stanley mountain range over eastern New Guinea were of a height that the planes could not pass through the higher altitude with its thinner air. So it would have to be a flight over the Solomon Sea, just south of New Britain, then turn north and make for Rabaul's airfields and harbor installations. Now, as for those three American aircraft carriers, the Japanese were right to be concerned about them. Fortunately for the new owners of Rabaul, Admiral Chester Nimitz, the new commander of the Pacific Fleet, based at Pearl, knew that the current status of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was such that there would be no retaking of territory anytime soon. No, the best that Nimitz could do, but wanted it done ASAP, was a series of hit-and-run raids. The Japanese, who had been planning for this war, in great detail for some time, might be able to run the board for now, but that did not mean the U.S. Navy was going to let them have it for cheap. Of the still operational carriers, Enterprise, Lexington, and Yorktown, Task Force 11, centered around the Lexington and commanded by Vice Admiral Wilson Brown, sailed out of Pearl on the last day of January, 1942. Around the Lex were four heavy cruisers and ten destroyers. Admiral Brown's objective was to make a hit and run on Rabaul, as the Japanese, Allied intelligence said, were readying their own raid on the islands of New Caledonia, about 970 miles or 1,516 kilometers east through the Coral Sea from Australia's northeast coast, and the New Hebrides itself about 250 miles or 400 kilometers northeast from New Caledonia. New Caledonia first became known to the Europeans due to Captain James Cook sailing near it in 1774. He dubbed it New Caledonia as a part of the coastline reminded him of Scotland. 
At first, the archipelago was desired for its sandalwood, but later its main business became slavery. And then, after the French, under Napoleon III, set up a settlement there in 1853, nickel was discovered. The islands also served as a penal colony for those French citizens who broke the law back home. But when France fell in the summer of 1940, the General Council of New Caledonia voted to support the Free French Government. Not that its status would have mattered to the Japanese. It, along with the New Hebrides Islands, modern-day Vanuatu, were a lifeline between the United States and Australia. As such, that line had to be cut. But the story of New Caledonia is far from over. The archipelago would serve as a base for Allied forces, American and Australian, that engaged the Japanese in the Battle of the Coral Sea in early May. But that is in the future. Admiral Wilson Brown was 59 years old, so one of the oldest commanders to fight in the war. And besides, he had never piloted a plane. But he was aggressive, and that's all that Nimitz cared about. Brown's idea was to get Task Force 11 within 125 miles, or 201 kilometers, of Rabaul, and then launch his aircraft. If all went well, their bombs would wreck facilities and ruin grounded planes. This would hopefully go off on February 21st. And yet... As the sun rose on February 20th, four Kawanishi Type 97 long-range flying boats, known to the Allies as Mavises, left Rabaul. They were expected to conduct search patterns of some 500 miles, or 800 kilometers out. About the same time, the carrier Lexington launched its own scouts. But as these six planes were dive bombers, they would only patrol some 300 miles, or 482 kilometers, out. At 10.15 a.m. that morning, the carrier's radar detected contact, and it was only 35 miles away. One of those Japanese patrol boats was coming in close. Admiral Brown sent aloft Grumman F-4F Wildcat fighters to intercept. Meanwhile, the flying boat's pilot, Lieutenant Naburu Sakai, radioed back to Rabaul of the carrier's location, after which Sakai made his way into a thick cloud. But the carrier's radar was able to keep up with the hidden plane, and thus guided two of its wildcats towards it. As the flying boat exited the clouds, Sakai's plane exploded, being shredded by wildcat bullets. As the Japanese officers were experienced enough to know that, sometimes, mistakes are made by excitable young men, another flying boat was ordered to track down the carrier for confirmation. This time, the Lexington sent two other wildcats towards the plane of Warrant Officer Kiyoshi Hayashi. This second Japanese scout plane soon splashed into the waters below. The good news for Admiral Brown was that his ships were safe. The bad news was that the task force had been spotted. There could be no surprise air raid, and going up against land-based bombers was asking for more trouble than it was worth. Brown decided to wait until a second carrier could join him. Only then would the odds be more in his favor. However, this left the Japanese free to respond to the American threat. As Task Force 11 was too far away for Japanese fighters, it was decided to send out Mitsubishi G4M1 Type 1 Model 11 twin-engine bombers, known as Bettys, to the Allies. As these impressive bombers each had four machine guns and a 20mm cannon in their rear, it was felt that sending them out without fighter protection was justified. But there were flaws in this plane. The Betty did not have armor, nor were its fuel tanks self-sealing, to which the Americans labeled the Bettys flying Zippos. Admiral Brown was cautious enough to keep a patrol overhead, knowing he had been spotted. The question was, would the Japanese respond? And if yes, how? 
he got his answer at 4.15 p.m. that same day. Just as his six-plane patrol was about to land back on the Lexington due to fuel, its replacements had just finished taking off. Radar detected several enemy planes coming right at the patrol that needed to land. Flight Director Officer Lieutenant Frank Gill, who directed the planes, told the older patrol to meet up with the new patrol and together to go after the enemy formation. This was carried out, and the American fighters were too much for the enemy bombers. Most went down right away. Still, four of them released their payloads, but were wide of the mark. Then three more bombers went down. But the Japanese pilots were nothing if not brave. The lone bomber, knowing his chances of making it home were minute, instead swung around and went into a dive to strafe the carrier. Yet the defensive guns on Lexington brought down this last enemy bomber. Thinking the day's drama was over, it was as the last bomber went down that a second group of nine enemy bombers were detected. As they were coming in from a different direction, the fighters were out of position to stop them from getting to the carrier. That is, except for two planes of the first patrol now desperately low on fuel. Yet they were the only option. As the two American fighters closed in, each pilot depressed his machine gun trigger, but one of the plane's guns jammed. So it was all up to Lieutenant Edward H. Butch O'Hare to intercept them. Flying in even closer to the formation, Butch quickly took out two of the bombers. Focusing on the next few planes, he inflicted enough damage that three more turned away. But by now, the remaining bombers had a fix on him and were giving the American hell with their 20mm cannon. But staying focused, soon two more bombers fell to Butch's gun. Then a third went down, but Butch was sure he had not even hit it. Either way, the task force was safe once again. In all, the Japanese lost two four-engine flying boats and 16 two-engine bombers to the Americans' loss of two fighters. Reports of this shocked Admiral Inoue, commander of the Imperial South Seas Force, who was ready to move on and invade the towns of Leh and Salamawa on New Guinea. Now, that would have to be delayed at least by a week, until more fighter protection was available. And Inoue wanted that additional firepower in the form of another carrier. Admiral Brown wasn't the only one calling in reinforcements. With Rabaul firmly in Japanese hands, it was their intention to expand its facilities to become a major air and sea base. But that meant the work there, currently underway by engineers, had to be left uninterrupted. Hence, a defensive shield around the entirety of New Britain was required. Further, if a ring could be created around the island, then the Bismarck Sea to the north of eastern New Guinea and the whole of New Britain would be inaccessible to the Allies. Hence, that more easterly route to places like Guam, the Philippines, where MacArthur vowed to return, Okinawa, and lastly, the Japanese home islands, would be cut off. Yet, attempting to hinder this very process, the Australians were already sending in bombing raids from Port Moresby, again on the southeastern coast of New Guinea, and from airfields from other New Guinea towns and Australia itself. Which is probably why, in part, that the towns of Leh and Salamawa in northeastern New Guinea were to be added to the Japanese defensive ring around New Britain. To take those two cities, along with their nearby airfields, was to deny them to the enemy, but also a chance to strike further afield for the Japanese. In war, the adage goes, expand or die. Besides which, Ley and Salamala were currently themselves being used by the Allies as forward bases, from further away Darwin and Townsville in northeastern Australia. The Japanese occupation of them 
would reduce the Aussies' ability to project power. Taking those two towns was codenamed SR Operation by the Japanese, and, in all truth, it would turn out to be another Rabaul all over again. The invaders, in overwhelming numbers, would invade Leh and Salamala, which were barely defended. The Japanese fleet, leaving Rabaul at 1 p.m. on March 5th, carrying the two invasion forces, consisted of the 6th Torpedo Squadron of six destroyers, one light cruiser, one seaplane tender, three minesweepers, and five transport ships, and this fleet would be met along the way by another Japanese fleet for extra protection. But the truth was, the combined naval might of the Aussies and Americans had nothing comparable in the area. On the afternoon of March 7th, the Aussies received two reports from Hudson bombers flying photo reconnaissance missions. The first, flying over a bow, reported that the harbor, which had been crammed with all kinds of ships, was now practically empty. And answering where those ships could have gone, the second report spotted the combined fleets and invasion force just 55 miles from New Guinea itself which meant it was too late to send in bombers to attack. After being spotted, the Japanese fleet again broke into two groups. The naval troops went for Leh, and the army transports went to Salamaua. By 4.30 a.m. March 8th, Salamaua, the town and nearby airfield, were occupied. But even before this was done, Leh and its airfield had already been captured. As there had been rain over Rabaul during the invasions, no air support was possible. Not that it turns out it was needed. The few Australian troops and the town's civilians retreated into the jungle when the Japanese arrived. But the weather was better to the south, so the Australians, in the form of five RAAF Hudsons and the Americans with three B-17 Flying Fortresses, made bombing runs in the afternoon of March 8th, but their results were far from impressive. The retreating Aussies of the New Guinea Volunteer Rifles and the 222nd Battalion watched from the jungles as the Japanese came ashore and immediately began restoring the airfields to operational status. Soon, the fighters of 4th Air Group would leave Rabaul and land in Salamaua. The harassment of Port Moresby would be increased. As for the retreating Australian troops, accompanied by civilians, they walked along the Francisco River Valley towards Wa, about 50 miles or 80 kilometers southwest of Salamaua, which itself is due south of Ley. They used the Black Cat Track Path, for there were few roads deep within New Guinea, and if they survived the disease-infested jungle, the barrier of the landscape, should protect them from pursuit. As the troops reached the last rope bridge over the Francisco River, it was cut to fall away into the waters below. Hopefully, the Japanese would never come this far south, being content with what they had. But it was not to be. As for the Japanese, they would have either not been excited to come south, or perhaps would have moved faster south had they known that coming ever closer to Port Moresby was a powerful American fleet made up of the carriers Lexington and Yorktown, with eight cruisers and 14 destroyers. Admiral Wilson Brown got his second carrier. Just below the most eastern tip of New Guinea is the Coral Sea, which also touches the northeast coast of Australia. Through it, Admiral Brown's fleet was sailing, having just dropped off 15,000 American soldiers on New Caledonia from Melbourne on Australia's southern coast. In time, there would be 50,000 U.S. troops on New Caledonia, such was its importance, which would match the number of natives on the island. And it would be many of these American troops landing now that would fight alongside U.S. Marines on Guadalcanal. 
Though Admiral Brown's fleet had taken those Japanese bombers out of the sky, he still wanted to chastise the enemy at Rabaul. But as he got closer to Port Moresby, he learned of the enemy's taking of Leh and Salamawa. Now his world view was altered. First, now there weren't that many enemy ships at Rabaul, as many of them had been involved in the invasions. And secondly, it was imperative that the Japanese not strengthen themselves in their two new conquests. To allow that was to probably lose New Guinea, and if that happened, well, all of North Australia, its northeastern coast, as well as Darwin to the northwest coast, could be hammered, or perhaps occupied. No, a nightmare of the domino effect. But still needing to protect the two of the U.S. Pacific Fleet's three carriers that he had, Brown decided to get closer to Port Moresby and then launch his planes across New Guinea itself, hopefully catching the enemy positions at Ley and Salamaua off guard. The good news was that the further west he went, the further away those enemy bombers at Robau would be. But the bad news was that his pilots would have to fly over the Owen Stanley mountain range, due south of these two new Japanese positions, of which parts of it rose almost 13,000 feet. As the Americans knew practically nothing about New Guinea, and even less about its interior, Admiral Brown sent out two men ahead to find out the best way to carry out their air attack. Fortunately, the two resourceful men found out about the pass between the mountain range. If the pilots used that, the height they would have to fly over was only 7,500 feet. Then came the bad news. The pass was normally covered by mist, meaning visibility was cut down enough to guarantee slamming into a mountain. But however the heights affected the weather patterns there, the mist did not set in until about 10 a.m. each day, which meant the pilots would have to fly over, make their attack runs, and be back across the mountains by that time, or risk flying blind. Still, the last piece of the puzzle was in place. So, at 7.50 a.m. on March 10th, the Lexington sent off flyers and dive bombers. A few minutes later, the Yorktown followed suit. Now there were 104 planes in the air, heading for the pass. The Air Group Commander, William Alt, flew over the mountain range, guiding his force on their 201-kilometer or 120-mile flight. Below him were 60 Douglas Dauntless dive bombers, 26 Douglas Devastator torpedo bombers, and 18 Grubman F-4F Wildcat fighters. The attack was everything Admiral Brown could have hoped for. The Japanese, not possessing radar, were caught completely off guard as the Americans emerged from the mountain range. Even better, the targets had no fighter protection as they were still at Rabaul, waiting for the airfields to be repaired. First, the Douglas Dauntless dive bombers came in, going after the enemy ships at Ley at 9.22 a.m. Meanwhile, Dauntless dive bombers from another squadron hit the vessels at Salamawa at 9.38 a.m. This left the Wildcats, as there was no enemy fighters to engage, to strafe both locations. As the first bombs fell, the Japanese began to move their ships out into the open water, but they were pursued, with a few bombs striking true, while others were close calls. Yet the anti-aircraft guns at Salamawa took down one dauntless dive bomber. When this first group came back through the pass, their radios were full of bravado and braggadocio. Americans reported that the enemy had lost two heavy cruisers, a light cruiser, a single destroyer, a mine layer, and five transports. Probable sinking were two more destroyers and a gunboat. But the raid wasn't over just yet. When the first wave came back, eight B-17 Flying Fortresses 
from Townsville on the northeast coast of Australia hit both enemy beachheads. These pilots claimed to have sunk two ships with four more on fire and one beached in order to save itself from going under. However, as we have seen previously, had the American claims been true, the Japanese would have been crippled then and there. All future operations would have been put on hold. However, the Japanese reported four transports sunk, and that Admiral Kijaoka's flagship, the Yubari, had been lightly damaged, along with damage to a fifth transport and two more destroyers. But the Americans did kill 126 naval personnel and six soldiers, with 240 naval personnel and 17 other soldiers wounded. Not that it mattered, as the American version was relayed back to FDR, who passed it on to Churchill. The latter responded with saying, the most cheering thing that happened in the Pacific so far. But the truth was worse than just eager, young, inexperienced men seeing flashes of flame and assuming the worse. Nor did they factor in their faulty torpedoes. The reality was this. 104 planes had hit two targets with enemy ships nearby and achieved total surprise. The results should have been devastating for the Japanese, but they were not. In fact, the day after the American and Australian air raid, the Japanese South Seas Detachment occupied Finshafen, about 50 miles east of Leh, on the Huon Peninsula of New Guinea. And this had already been scheduled. No, the Japanese, though surprised, were not impressed. As for General Hori, the commander of the Army's South Seas Detachment, he took the attack in stride as he laid out the changes he wanted before their next target was hit, Port Moresby itself. Hori told his superiors that, clearly, there were two American carriers in the area, so he would need more aircraft on New Guinea, but also wanted another carrier besides the Shoho, a converted light carrier, when they went after Port Moresby. Also, he wanted more transports, but not for personnel, but rather to act as anti-aircraft batteries. He also wanted paratroops for this upcoming operation, but he was only given the green light for his first two requests. Still, these changes would take time, which would lead to the Battle of Coral Sea when the Japanese did come to land at Port Moresby. For his part, not knowing, of course, that the Japanese were about to come at Port Moresby, General MacArthur, now the commander-in-chief of all Allied forces in the Southwest Pacific, and yes, we will get to that soon, ordered continuous raids on Ley and Salamaua throughout April from Townsville and wanted the air facilities at Moresby increased. Still, despite all this, the Japanese continued to expand their bases on New Guinea. And it was this determined Japanese progress on New Guinea which truly cut off the Americans from the Bismarck Sea, the waters north of New Britain, and the eastern half of New Guinea. The general would not be returning to the Philippines anytime soon. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. Um, as far as the storyline, we may put a pin in the fighting here so I can then cover the opening battles in Burma and then circle around to the Philippines, which will lead to MacArthur, the Arcadia Conference, Churchill coming over, and the selection of Nimitz to head out to lead the war in the Pacific. Um, so we'll see how it goes. I don't want to get too far ahead in one area and leave other areas behind. Also, again, for those of you who have signed up for membership, and I will thank you all next time, um, I really do appreciate the support, especially in these trying times. We've all been hit hard financially, and we're just trying to hang in there. For everyone else, um, for you can find out the information on WorldWar2Podcast.net, which is getting a facelift 
from Paul Finch, my tech guru. Thank you, Paul, for that. It should be up in a couple of weeks, so check that out. Um, so anyway, yeah, so you can sign up for membership if you are so inclined. And uh, Five bucks a month, you get two extra episodes where I kind of tell the stories behind the main story of World War II. So you can check out the website for that if you are so interested. And I will see you as soon as I can with the next episode, whether it's the Philippines or Burma. Uh, I don't want to get into the Battle of the Coral Sea yet, even though I am looking forward to that very much. So please be safe. This thing that we're going through is far from over. Um, so just hang in there and be patient with each other. And as always... Take care, everyone. One Mississippi, two Mississippi. Keep counting at those stop signs, Alex. Full stop and doesn't go until she counts to five, McSweeney. Because you are a safe driver. And like most drivers who sign up for Snapshot from Progressive, which customizes your rate for how and how much you drive, you could earn a discount for your good driving. So don't turn into an Alex rolling stop and goes whenever she wants, McSweeney. Because once an Alex full stop and doesn't go until she counts to five, McSweeney, always an Alex full stop. Well, you know the rest. Sign up for Snapshot today. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Snapshot not available in all states or from all agents.